Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, an untreated crisis taking lives. Alcohol is killing more people in New Mexico than anywhere else in the country, and the problem goes far beyond DWI. We kind of miss the forest for the trees, because when you look at alcohol-related deaths nowadays, DWIs only account for about one in 10 of them. And Albuquerque City Council voting to stop the creation of new homeless camps, but will the mayor go along with that plan? New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. Albuquerque's struggle to address homelessness is evolving. This week, City Council voted to stop the creation of any new encampments after the mayor announced he was clearing out Coronado Park. So what now? Our line opinion panel will discuss in a little over 10 minutes. Then in about 20 minutes, we preview the historic anniversary at one of the state's marquee events, the 100th Santa Fe Indian Market. Hear from an artist showing his work for the first time at the market and some of the new attractions happening this year. But we start with a topic that our friends at New Mexico In Depth put into the spotlight this month, alcohol abuse in New Mexico. If you haven't read it already, they published an extensive seven-part series called Blind Drunk. Journalist Ted Alcorn focuses on the issue itself, drunk driving, alcohol's impact on violent crime, myths when it comes to who carries the burden of this problem, failings in our state's public policy, and the overarching issue of addiction and how it's treated. There's a lot to this, so we brought in Mr. Alcorn and a panel of experts to talk through the various factors while trying to find solutions. Here's part one of that discussion. Hello everyone, we're joined by Ted Alcorn today. He's a writer and an independent journalist who did a great deal of work on this project. We also have Dr. Camilla Venner. She's an associate professor of clinical psychology at the University of New Mexico. Dr. Jenny Wei, an internal medicine physician at Gallup Indian Medical Center and state representative Joanne Ferrari for Doña Ana County. Thank you all for joining us for this important discussion. We wanna follow this very closely here at New Mexico PBS and we thank you for your time today. Ted, let me start with you, of course. You wrote an article, wrote this, each article in a seven part series in case folks have not seen this yet on alcohol use and misuse here in New Mexico. Can you start by explaining how this project came about and what did you think this, why did you think this uh, issue deserved this kind of coverage? Well, about a year ago, New Mexico and Death asked me to look into a story on alcohol. They had some suspicions that the mortality we were seeing for COVID was connected to alcohol use in the state. Mm -hmm. But it didn't take long for me to notice uh, some of the, the basic factors that make alcohol really stand out. New Mexico has uh, not only the highest rate of alcohol-related deaths in the country, we have the highest rate head and shoulders over every other state. And the more I learned, the more I felt like uh, this sort of catastrophe that was happening in plain sight was the result of a lot of misconceptions that we have about how alcohol affects our population, what we can do about it. Mm -hmm. And so as, as the reporting went on, I spoke to more and more people and collected data. It, it felt like uh, it needed a lot of space to grow. Um, so in the end, as you said, it became a seven part series and I, I interviewed over 150 people for it. And, um, you know, I think we came to some conclusions uh, that surprised even me. Mm -hmm. One of those conclusions, by the way, in the, the first in the series is brilliantly titled An Emergency Hiding in Plain Sight. A very apt title there. Kind of sets the stage with this issue and we're facing in New Mexico. Let me ask you this, through your research, you found drinking kills New Mexicans at a much higher rate than anywhere else in the country. The conclusion reaches that we failed to address this crisis in part because we've misunderstood it. What, what's been the big misunderstanding in your research? Well, there's been a few misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. I think the first one um, growing up in Albuquerque in the 1990s was that I was you know, both aware of the tremendous problem of DWI in our state, but mm -hmm. also um, buffeted by the policy prescriptions that we were starting to put in place because at that point our state really made a collective and systematic and sustained effort to reduce DWI. And I think that that, that has had numerous benefits. Uh, we brought down the rates of uh, crash fatalities uh, a lot, mm -hmm. but we kind of missed the forest for the trees because when you look at alcohol related deaths nowadays, DWIs only account for about one in 10 of them. So nine in 10 of alcohol related deaths in the state are, are occurring mm -hmm. elsewhere. We overlook the role that alcohol plays in violence. Uh, as it turns out, you know, we have, of course, 
widespread shared concerns about having a safer state. Our elected officials are talking about it. What they don't often say is that 40 percent of people who died by homicide in the state died with alcohol in their blood, mm. as did 30 percent of people who died by suicide. So, so alcohol is the most common intoxicant in violence in New Mexico. Mm. Those are the kind of the kind of blind spots, I think, that have kept us from addressing this issue head on. Good points there. I want to bring in Dr. Jenny Wei on this issue. Um, doctor, how should we approach this clearly life-threatening, uh, you know, issue? And what do we need to do to get a better understanding as New Mexicans about the depth of the problem? I think the main important thing is that, the, you know, alcohol use disorders, people who struggle with alcohol use disorders, it's a multifactorial cause, you know. And I think because of that, there are a lot of differing preferences as to how uh, people want to be treated. Mm -hmm. um, differing main underlying causes result in different types of treatment options. So for example, I think a lot of people struggle with, uh, I work at the Gallup Indian Medical Center who serves primarily Native Americans who suffer from depression, anxiety, PTSD. A lot of people who struggle with alcohol use disorders also have comorbid mental health disorders. And it's important to treat all of those. Right. Um, and it's important to treat, uh, you know, I think what we say a lot in addiction medicine is that every door is the right door, whether it's through my primary care clinic, whether it's through when they get admitted to the hospital in the intensive care unit after a motor vehicle accident or broken bones, or whether it's through the emergency department, we need to make sure that in every possible door that people are entering, that there are treatment options available that we offer them in the emergency department when they're admitted to the hospital here and when I see them in the primary care setting. I think too often as a as primary care doctors, we feel we, we treat the 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 complications of alcohol use disorders like liver disease, um, like the broken bone that happened at the, or, you know, the motor vehicle accident mm -hmm. um, injuries. Mm -hmm. But we don't really under treat the underlying cause of all of these problems in the first place, which, of course, is their alcohol use disorder. And given the extent of the problem, we cannot just put that on behavioral health specialists, psychiatrists. We as primary care providers need to be taking ownership of this as well, given how severely under-resourced our behavioral health departments are in in the state. And so I very much believe that uh, as a general internal medicine provider, family medicine provider, general surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, all of us need to be able to treat alcohol use disorders and not just uh, rely on the non-existent uh, behavioral health department that may not be able to get an appointment for many, many months. Mm. If, I, if I may, I just wanted mm -hmm. to put that in context too, because the, the state has looked at the scale of untreated substance use in the state. Mm -hmm. And um, we talk, of course, a lot about the state's struggles with opiates, fentanyl, methamphetamines, but alcohol is the biggest untreated substance use problem in New Mexico. There are 73,000 people who are estimated to have an alcohol disorder who aren't getting treated. And that's more than people with disorders of, for all other substances combined. So it shows that there's a big opportunity for the, for the care that Dr. Ways mentioned. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you got that in, that's an important point. Dr. Venner, um, you know, interestingly, when I w reading the series, it really struck me how screening by docs could be so impactful here. It, it, it just, it, wh why is this not really kind of taking root just a little bit with a little bit more vigor inside medical circles? I'm curious your opinion on that. Well, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a clinical psychologist, but mm -hmm. what my understanding, uh, doctors have a lot to do in their 12 minutes or 15 minutes that they have Fair with enough. patients. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be, um, you know, a, an issue of time. There's also an issue of um, training, not a lot of training in medical school and residencies focus on addiction for as much as it shows up in clinics, they don't get that much training. Um, so I think there can be a self-efficacy piece where they're not really entirely sure um, what to do if, they, if the patient does screen positive in a slight brief intervention in a compassionate way um, to talk about, you know, um, what are they thinking? Here's a, you know, what we're seeing. What do you think about that? And having a nice conversation and having an open door, like Jenny Way says, um, every door is right. Um, so I think there's a lot more we can do for training mm -hmm. medical students and um, helping um, doctors feel, you know, more self-efficacy like Dr. Way feels. So I think there's a lot we can do to help that situation. Mm -hmm. Representative, uh, just on that oh, point, please, absolutely. Um, I'd just like to 
add that, you know, back in the 90s when we passed the major legislation to, you know, combat uh, DWI, um, we did consider the behavioral health problems of it too, um, but uh, didn't really reach as far as we um, wanted to. Um, but something that came out from them was to somehow incentivize um, doctors uh, by every time that they uh, do the uh, SAMHSA uh, screening and make it so that, you know, we can incentivize them to go ahead and do that and help their patients. Interesting. Um, Representative, let me stay with you on this. I mean, obviously we had a, the awful news with the parade and gallop with the injuries suffered by somebody who appeared to be in, impaired behind the wheel and just an awful situation when the law enforcement approached the vehicle, it just took off. Does it make it harder when we have situations like that to, or does it actually help move things along in a certain way? How, how do you see that as a rep, as an elected representative? Well, um, I know that um, Ted has been working on this series for a long time, since probably the beginning of the year at least. Mm -hmm. um, and like in the 90s, when we were starting to look at um, the overall package of you know DWI uh, changes that we needed, um, the Cravens crash yes. um, tragedy happened. And um, just as we were getting ready to go to the legislature, uh, Nadine Milford and her husband Bob became advocates for the change that we needed. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope it brings the attention that we need to motivate um, the what we you know should start. Like the governor immediately setting up a task force with legislators and uh, and all of the experts, such as Dr. Way and. Um, Miss um, Bummer, <laughs> and um, we need to make sure that we use scientific, evidence-based uh, approaches again to revitalize the not just DWI, the enforcement and helping the victims and the and preventing the consequences, but overall for alcohol-related deaths. And this is really important um, because I think, as Ted pointed out, that. Um, adverse childhood experiences are uh, usually related to someone in the family for domestic violence, for right. child right. and neglect and abuse. Um, all of these different things seem to coalesce around the um, alcohol abuse. During the COVID you know, pandemic, there was a lot of reflection going on. And um, it was kind of a stagnant time for everybody, a lot of the artists and uh, a lot of artists lost out. So the 100th coming around after that is a huge redemption for a lot of the artists and it's, it's a relief. So for me, that's exciting to see other artists come together, bring in their best work. You know, my lifetime, um, our lifetime, we'll never see another 100. Um, so that's a, this is an important event. It's pretty exciting. Thank you to Mr. Alcorn and the rest of our guests who participated in our roundtable discussion on alcohol. I'll be back with that group once more to round out that conversation. At the bottom of the hour, we'll get into how alcohol is taxed in our state and stats that turn some common stereotypes on their head. But it's time for our other esteemed panel, The Line. Joining us this week is attorney Sophie Martin, former state senator Diane Snyder, and KOB radio host TJ Trout, thank you all for making the time to be with us this week. Now, we're starting with the latest developments in the city's plan to address homelessness. The Albuquerque City Council this week voted to stop the creation of any new homeless encampments. That's before the first and only camp was approved at a lot near Manal, near I-25, as most might know. Now, is everyone with the city on the same page here, TJ Trout? Are they pulling in different, different directions, meaning... You know, the mayor ordered the closing of Coronado Park without a backup plan for all these folks to go to. What's going on here? Suddenly everything's in disarray. All right, let me back the truck up. Please. <laughs> because earlier this week, you said to me, when you told me that you wanted me on the show, you said, man, we're going to talk about the homeless thing. We're going to talk about outdoor spaces. This is going to be right up your wheelhouse, TJ. And I'm going, <laughs> what? <laughs> I would I would make the worst politician ever, and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. Because I would be expected to have a plan and to be able to defend my plan and then be able to implement my plan. That's right. I don't have a plan. Nobody has a plan. 
I don't care what they say. Nobody anywhere has a plan. If there was a plan, every city in America would be jumping on it and fixing the homeless problem. Safe open spaces, Gene, I don't know. Who knows? Seriously, this is what I would do. Mm -hmm. Seriously. And, and they, they maybe they tried doing this. They need to really do it. If I were the mayor, whatever, I'd go, everybody, I would go on TV, go to the media, and I'd say, look, this is the mayor speaking. Look, we don't have a good plan. Nobody has a good plan. Mm -hmm. We need a good plan. We need some good ideas. We got the Gateway Center opening, but we need some ideas how to solve this. Please help us write, email, go to council meetings. We are begging you, help us. Mm -hmm. We need your help. And then maybe I would go to I go to UNM, go to NMSU, uh, any number of institutes of higher learning, and and give their sociology departments a big fat grant. Have them study the issue. I don't know. Have they done this already? I don't, I don't know. I don't, safe outdoor spaces, Gene. Maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. If this is as if this is as important as I think it is, and it is, ask a bunch of smart people, including the public, to figure this out. I, like now, the I just idea read an article. I, yeah. Yeah. I, well, I just read an article online. I'm almost done. I just read an article online from uh, KRQE, and I will give the city credit for one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they were interviewing uh, Christina Parjan, who was the uh, gateway administrator for the city, mm -hmm. and they actually had a good idea. They actually asked homeless people what they need, mm -hmm. what they would need in a gateway center. What a concept. I mean, you know, it makes total sense. These people are on the streets. They know better than anyone else what would help and what wouldn't. So at least the city did that. Mm -hmm. You know, and just a reminder for our viewers, in case you don't know, in June, uh, city it's not that long ago, city council voted uh, to change the city's zoning code and allow for these designated homeless camps. Yeah. But Monday, on Monday, Sophie, Monday night uh, this week, council, of course, flipped its decision to vote to pass a moratorium. It's a very sort of a one side or the other. Is the moratorium going too far here? I mean, I, 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 that's, a, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think it's worth noting just mm -hmm. as sort of a side note, but this is the same city council. It's not like right. we had an election in the in-between time and it's a totally new slate of folks. Excellent and point. It is the same city council and uh, Councilwoman Brooke Bassan, uh, you know, put that put that bill forward for the moratorium where mm -hmm. she had voted in favor um of the city's plans before um i i th i think in some ways this probably goes back a bit to what tj was just saying which is there are no great solutions here mm -hmm. albuquerque has had this problem for decades the country has had this problem for decades and and i think more importantly the people who are unhoused have had this problem for <laughs> for so long and it is so so pervasive and unending and and um you know, I think that there is a lot of fear, unfortunately, around the issue as well. Um, members of you know the community may not wish to be confronted by the fact that there is a is a homelessness problem here in the in the city, and so it does feel a bit whiplashish mm -hmm. to have it to have it turn this quickly. Um, and I think what what many of us are hoping for is that is is that if there's going to be a moratorium that serious work is done on the issue during that period mm -hmm. because you know plans have been laid um, promises were more or less made That's and right. and now that is collapsed but we're not in a better place because of the moratorium we're not you know we don't have a, a less serious problem um, regarding homelessness, mm -hmm. uh, we, we're, we're just as bad, if not worse, at you, this point. You know, when you think about it, guys, um, and going to Senator Snyder here with this, a moratorium till next August, meaning August of 2023, if that isn't the ultimate kicking the can down the road, I mean, do you need a year to get this going? I mean, let me remind you, that camp at Manal near I-25 was created as a replacement of sorts for that Coronado Park yeah. closure, right? I mean... What are these people supposed to do for a year? <laughs> you know what I mean? Before we get a plan together. It just seems, something seems very off here. I'm curious your, your sense of it as you watch this. I feel like I, I quite truthfully, like I'm a bubble, uh, bobble doll. This way, that way, right. this way, this way. No. You know, it's like, okay, what are we doing today? And I haven't dug down into it, mm -hmm. the issue, but I, because as you've all said, we've had this issue forever. But the logical part of me goes, okay, 
we're doing a moratorium, but why did we also cancel out Coronado Park or the new place right now Right. when we didn't have it? To me, we don't have enough accurate data. I mean, was it working or was it not working? Was it because of neighborhoods? Was it because of not having the right services? Uh, what? I don't think we even know uh, whether it will be successful or not. That's right. Maybe it has been in other cities, but we don't have enough data to tell us that. And I kind of just go, why would you, I can understand no new ones. If you want to study and make sure it's the right thing to be doing, I can understand that. But why would you throw all these people out of a park with no place to go. And let, me, mean, let, me, let, me, let me add to that, Senator, as well, and I'm gonna swing to TJ here. Uh, the reason Ms. Bassan proposed this as a stopgap, this, this almost year-long uh, moratorium, is that there is another bill that will remove safe outdoor spaces from the zoning code completely. It seems like we've gone from one end of this deal all the way to the other. It was this great idea in June, and now we wanna put it in, you know, <laughs> in writing yeah. that this can't happen ever again? So something seems to have gone a little goofy here. It just, it just doesn't make sense, TJ. Well, the, the, it seems to me that uh, I think the city and the, some people in the city council are in uh, serious bury their heads in the sand denial over this whole thing. And Gene, I think it goes back to what you said earlier about uh, people are not admitting how big of a issue this really is mm -hmm. and uh I, th I think they're af they're afraid of uh, having to spend real money on it to fix it um i think they're afraid of having to uh confront oh my god uh, f the social issues that have to be confronted here uh and 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 it, it's again i think people are just throwing their hands up and again they don't have a solution mm -hmm. and they, they just Look. don't know what to do Sophie, let me ask you this. We've had two churches step up to the plate here and offer to use their parking lots and their facilities for overnight homeless or unhoused folks to sleep in their cars and one of them and the other one to sleep in tents in their parking lot. Is there anything wrong with churches extending a hand to the homeless out here? Why should I mean, they I think, be stopped? I think at least some of the churches would argue that that's part of their mission and, and part of their, you know, their belief system. Right. Um, however, I will point out, I have to be the lawyer for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, religious institutions are not completely free from regulation by, mm -hmm. by government as long as the regulation is sort of faith neutral, for lack of a better way to put it. So um, if you're not able to put it in a park, if, if you know, a business can't put it in their parking lot, I would expect that, that as well, churches would be prohibited from doing the same unless there's a specific carve out and then you get other legal issues too. But, but the upshot is I think we are seeing community members and groups who are saying, we do want to be part of the solution here. Right. We do think that we can um, responsibly and effectively help at least a small portion of the community who who are so impacted. And, and it is unfortunate that those groups also will not be able to do that. Well, I'm going to wrap this up here. I'll tell you what, though, what seems to me after June, from June to August, if you're so hot to trot on something, you're willing to vote for it in June, and then uh, because Ms. Bassan mentions here the overwhelming public outcry to go the other direction, if you're just gonna be you know, running back and forth with the winds of the public, why are you in elected office? I mean, I mean this, is, this is really, you, you cannot govern like this because everyone rises up, suddenly you're gonna ban everything forever after it was a great idea in June. I, I don't know, something needs, someone needs to step well, in here. So. It suggests that all we have to do is start a phone writing, a phone call or a letter writing campaign, you right. know, or <laughs> they nasty things on Twitter. Senator, can I get you in? You have one last thought there, I see. Yeah, you. please. Mm -hmm. Quick things. Mm -hmm. uh, you can change your mind in that shorter time if you get the right information. But the other area that I'm very concerned about is all of our veterans, both yes. male and female, yes. who are in the population. Mm -hmm. Why well, I don't hear anything coming from the uh, United States Veterans Department or, air, uh, you know, military departments, why are we not providing them services from a different pot of money, from a different area? Because right. we also have the highest suicide rate of military yeah. and particularly women That's right. in the state of New Mexico. So we, we could divide people out a little bit 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as to who's funding it, where they're going to live. Those are the kinds of things that uh, maybe people have talked about. I don't know, right. but it doesn't seem like it. That's right. That's a good point there. Thank you all for your thoughts on that issue. It's not an easy one, and we're going to keep following it in the weeks and months ahead for sure. Now, this weekend in Santa Fe, a historic event is returning after a hiatus for COVID-19. The Santa Fe Indian Market is celebrating 100 years this year. It draws folks from around the world, as you might know, to the Santa Fe Plaza, where artists present their latest works. The Mexico in Focus correspondent Antonia Gonzalez sat down with the executive director of the association and an artist to talk about what people can expect when they visit this year. Patrick and Kim, welcome to New Mexico in Focus. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, it's hard to believe that the Santa Fe India Market is turning 100 years old. It's bringing excellence in arts and artists and sharing with the world. Kim, what does that mean to you? Wow. Um, you know, I always tell people that I uh, work for a 100-year organization and a startup. <laughs> and that just really has to do with the fact that, you know, we've got a lot of different things that we're trying to do. But truly, it is a privilege to just bring forth this organization that's that's been in existence for for a hundred years and to me it's an honor and a privilege and I am completely um, just excited for the what this event's going to bring us and it's also educating the public about native people yep. and building partnerships uh, Patrick why is that important um, I think there's a lot of different uh, variations when you ask that question but for me um, I mean awareness you know people that have this stereotypical idea of who we are anyways. And, you know, art is really the backbone of our culture. It always has been in a lot of different ways. And I think when you get the, the full perspective of, you know, the artist and the art that they're producing, you get a better understanding of who we are. So I think that's important. And Kim, reflecting on, you know, past years and looking at past events, what stands out in your mind that you're most proud of? Wow, so, you know, um, I can always reflect back to the 60s and 70s when my parents were participating in market and how small the footprint was and intimate it was. And, you know, that's a vast difference from this this event that we put on now. It's, it's over 650 booths and there's lots of different people and it really is a, a big event. And so... Um, you have to make a conscious effort to, to meet everybody and to have that opportunity to say, I, I touched you. Um, but I think that that's, that to me is, is one of the things that um, I'm in awe of is just how big Indian Market is. And not only our market, but then there's other markets and there's other people that are having an event. So when you really come to Santa Fe for, for our Indian Market, you really get um, a lot of experiences wherever you go. And Patrick, how important is that for artists? We know that COVID um, hit a lot of people hard, especially artists who rely on tourism um, for their income and a lot of people not being able to showcase their work. So why are these kinds of markets, especially India markets, so important for artists? Well, I think for, for me, um, you know, a lot of artists, you know, they come from not just, you know, they're from Canada, probably some in Mexico, all across the United States. And uh, you, you kind of feed off, you get a chance to feed off each other, you know, and that's really important. And, you know, during the COVID, you know, pandemic, there was a lot of reflection going on. And um, it was kind of a stagnant time for everybody, a lot of the artists and uh, a lot of artists lost out. So the hundredth coming around after that is a huge redemption for a lot of the artists and it's, it's a relief. So for me, that's exciting to see other artists come together, bring in their best work. You know, my lifetime, um, our lifetime, we'll never see another hundred. Um, so that's a, this is an important event. It's pretty exciting. Looking at art in the Southwest and how the India market has changed over the years, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Southwest, definitely Albuquerque, Santa Fe are known for the pottery, for the jewelry, mm -hmm. um, but it's much more. The market is much more than that, Kim. Mm -hmm. You know, just looking at what Swaya is doing um, in reference to Indian art, it really has been one that um, I feel the artists come to that with living culture and really share who they are and where they come from and well, how their art expresses that. Also, I think that the art that we're seeing um, really reflects on the times that we're at and, you know, we're known to record history through art and so you can definitely see that occurring. 
and then of course the competition and people just really excelling at their best and and competing against one another in a very healthy way so I think that there's lots of opportunities in that to see that and experience it from from our culture perspective but also when you look at the marquee events and you look at like the fashion show that's been an event that has really taken off and you know this year we have um, a fashion show during our gala and we have the marquee event on Sunday and so I, I feel that we're accommodating the demand for that and the interest in that and again I think that that is something that is evolving very quickly as well so we're I think we're having our 11th year as far as the fashion show is concerned. And Patrick is an artist what Kim's talking about about art reflecting how you know times today um, some of your art uh, with the Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, also featuring <clears throat> missing and murdered indigenous people. How are those pieces um, reflecting of today's society? Mm. Um, with the, uh, the Deb Holland piece, uh, that was really uh, projected on healing, um, the perspective of healing. Um, and it was a series that I did, not just the Deb Holland. Deb, that was kind of the grand poobah piece um, of the, the bodies of work that I produced uh, during that time. And um, I was fortunate to have a show. There was uh, uh, one of the Pueblos here had a show with for me and we had um, the group Ulali come in and, and perform and they were really a big act. And, you know, I got a chance to meet some of the people that um, had firsthand experience in the realm of, you know, MMIW and, and, uh, and tell their story of, you know, how they're, have, they're, they've overcame, you know, their healing and also, um, should just share their story with other people as well, and I think that's important. Kim, looking forward past the next hundred years, mm -hmm. what's your hope for Santa Fe Indian Market? For the next hundred years, um, you know, I, I really feel that COVID lent itself to this organization in, in a very profound way. We were able to really look at digital and what does that mean for our organization. Um, and so we are launching um, this month Indigenous Collections, which is an e-commerce platform. So our footprint is actually the United States and Canada, and so it'll be offered inclusively to all federally recognized natives in, in the north, northern continent here. And so I feel that that is one way that we can be inclusive as opposed to having an exclusive market. And so to me, that's the future of this organization is really finding ways to be creative and innovative in those efforts. Thank you, Antonia, for that interview. The 100th annual Santa Fe Indian Market on the Plaza starts at 8 a.m. Saturday morning. Let's welcome in our line opinion panel once more, this time to talk about a big rally for the Republican nominee for governor in Carlsbad, Mark Ronchetti and congressional candidate Yvette Harrell. We're joined by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. We'll get into some of the concerns about media access you might have heard about in a moment. But, Senator, I want to focus on the national optics here first. Mr. DeSantis, governor DeSantis has been a rising figure in the Republican Party in the last few years, no doubt about it, meaning the national GOP clearly sees an opportunity here. I'm just curious what your reaction is when you see a, such a big player in New Mexico in August. <laughs> Was this for Mr. Ronchetti? Was this for Mr. DeSantis? Who's, who was this rally really for here when, I, when you really kind of peel it back a little bit? Well, I think it was definitely for both of those mm -hmm. individuals. But I also think it was a real plus for the Republican Party of mm -hmm. New Mexico and all Republican candidates because it does clearly show an interest. And when you have a big name like Governor DeSantis coming in, then the money will follow, not, just, not necessarily from him, mm -hmm. but... People say, okay, well, if he, th people that admire him, if he thinks this is a good, th a good candidate, a good thing, then yes. And I know that, that I, well, I'm positive that Mark has re funding requests going out to other parts of the country because I'm getting them from everybody. I see. Uh, candidates, Republican candidates. Sure, sure. Uh, from all across the country. And I'm just going, but well, how'd you, it's because I gave and through the connections. And once your name's on the list, you're on it forever. But uh, so I know that it will increase funding opportunities, not only for for uh, Mark, but also for Yvette. Mm -hmm. And Yvette has a tight race as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, 
so I think, yeah, I thought it was a very good strategic move. I think the National Republican Party is very clear and focused. Think this is an opportunity. Uh, Ron Ketty is a strong candidate. If you think about the fact of how close five percentage points was the only difference between him and uh, Ben Ray Lujan That's right. in this U.S. Senate race, mm-hmm. that is incredibly close for a first time candidate. Mm-hmm. So I think and I, I have been impressed with some of his his advertising and marketing. So I think it's all to answer your original question. It's all fitting together mm-hmm. to everybody can benefit from it. I also let me, let me, think- let me hang on a quick sec there, Senator. We're just a little short on the on this subject on time. Oh, sorry. Uh, Sophie, yeah. the um, you know, Governor DeSantis spoke for 40 minutes, basically talking about how great he did in Florida during you know COVID-19 mm-hmm. and other things. Right. Right. Mark Ronchetti had to basically stand there and listen to him talk about Florida. You know, I ask again: Was this really so much for Mr. Ronchetti? Was oh this no. So- this is this is for Governor DeSantis. This yeah. is this is he is positioning himself as as the alternative to Trump. And I'll just note, I mean, I, I meant to bring this up and will when we get to the discussion of how journalists are being treated mm-hmm. at these events. Um, but but you know, just now, just recently, DeSantis has shown up at a at a rally for JD Vance. You know, he's he's barnstorming the country at this point. Mm-hmm. And I think to your point, the timing for the candidates given that the election is out in November, is not as compelling right now as the timing for DeSantis Uh because former President Trump keeps saying, I'm going to announce, I'm going to announce, I'm going to announce. And, you know, if if there's going to be an alternative for the Republican Party, Governor DeSantis wants to make sure that he is front and center. And, 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 and to be fair, he is considered to be the most likely candidate if, if former President Trump mm-hmm. doesn't run. Yep. But yeah, this is, this is his rainbow tour. This is, this is less about the local candidates mm-hmm. than about All right, let's get, let's get to that media problem. There were concerns over media access, TJ, at the rally. A reporter and a photographer from Source, New Mexico, were denied entry to the event. The reporter tried to use a general admission ticket second rather than a press credential, but was reportedly ID'd by private security officers from a photograph. That's kind of chilly. Uh, Credential press that were allowed inside the event were even discouraged from speaking with people in attendance or even moving around. Is this what we can expect from Mr. Ron Ketty if he punches through to be governor? Is that how he's going to handle the press? I hope not. I I certainly hope that's not going to be the case. I just want a a little uh, shameless plug here, uh, Mm -hmm. Gene. Uh, I'm going to have Sean Griswold from The Source uh, on my show on the uh, 24th. Uh, and so we're going to be talking nice. specifically about that. You know, and, and this, is, this is what kills me, mm-hmm. is that who who is to judge who is legitimate and who is illegitimate media? You know, so how, how wh- why are you allowed to parse out who you think should be attending these events? You know, Why are you a, allowed to just say you're a media person? Yeah, just give give I me. I can do that. But they're they're treating all media this way. This is this is one of the problems when you see that the yeah. JD Vance the event run by Turning Point. All media, regardless, are being treated yeah. uh, as if you know, as if they don't have legitimacy. That's right. Let me read yeah. you a quote here from Enrique Nell, someone I used to work with, and. Congresswoman Wilson's office a little those years ago. He is a spokesman for the Ron Ketty campaign. He said Source New Mexico was denied a credential because, quote, they are a left-wing advocacy group, not a legitimate news organization, end quote. That is so wrong. I, I don't even know where to start. I mean, it's just, uh, Senator, what's your thoughts on that? Why even go there and, and, and disparage I, a legitimate I, news organization? I, well, who makes it legitimate? That's my whole, I think the bigger issue here is who decides, I mean, Sophie can't be at practice law unless she has a law degree and is licensed with, for the bar. How do you decide who's going to be legitimate? Oh my gosh, I, are you arguing I, for regulation? I no, can't wait I to hear be, more. I might be, but, or just a definition. And I looked it up in Webster's and I'm going, well, this is no definition, but... <clears throat> How do I know? And also, then the other thing is, do I not have the right as a campaign to send out my media notices 
to the people that I want to come? Did he get a media notice or did he just pop over and say, I'm coming in? I think it's the candidates. Why would I want to invite somebody that is going to trash me? I mean, because really? It, because it's, it's, of, no, it's of it's of import to the voters throughout New Mexico. We rely on the media to be there when we can but and to provide the stories. And media. Uh, the original media in this country, if we're going to go originalism and watch okay. me do it right now, were pamphleteers. They were effectively bloggers. And Source is a well-established mm -hmm. over, I think they've just hit their year anniversary as a, as a media organization. They've broken stories across the state. Um, there's no question in my mind we've, that we've got they to wrap the up. I would, I, would I would challenge Enrique Nell on this air right now, if he's watching, I would challenge you to go through Source New Mexico's roster of stories and find me this left-wing advocacy you're talking about. Or you can give me some money. I'll take that challenge right here. Thanks again for that discussion, guys. We'll be back here at the line with the virtual roundtable for one final discussion on booming oil and gas revenues. That's just in over 10 minutes. But first, back to our conversation on alcohol here in New Mexico. If you're, if you're from out of state, you know we have some of the lowest alcohol taxes in the country. In part two of our discussion, we explore why that is and how a change could help mitigate this issue. Ted, I want to ask you about something that I think a lot of folks would find very interesting outside of political circles, and that is taxing alcohol and what it does to lessen the amount of drinking going on out there. If you would, in general terms, sort of lay out the framework of what that is and what you have discovered in your research as well. Well, historically, I think the public and lawmakers have often tended to think of alcohol taxes as a revenue raiser. Mm -hmm. We in, in our state and in many other states, we impose a very small excise tax on alcohol. And when you break it down to, to the amount per standard drink, we're talking about a few pennies. Um, but those pennies add up because we drink a lot and this, it, it raises about $50 million a year for the state. But what many people have overlooked is the fact that the taxes really are also a tool of public policy because they affect the price of the alcohol that's sold. And um, it's pretty clear that when the state imposes a tax on these items, the distributors or wholesalers pass that tax on to consumers. And so it artificially makes the substance a little bit more expensive. And this is important because the basic economic principles of supply and demand say that when you raise taxes a little bit, you reduce demand some. And in this case, you particularly rate, uh, reduce demand by young people who don't have necessarily as much access to cash and people that are really exposed to the price increases because they're consuming a lot of alcohol. And so uh, the research has gone on over many years and in many states. And on my read of it all, it seemed pretty definitive that when you raise alcohol taxes, there's a reduction in, in consumption and that you see a lot of reductions in the harms that alcohol can have. You see reductions in DWI, you see reductions in, in cirrhosis, some of the chronic conditions associated with alcohol. Um, so, you know, we know that this policy measure is effective. We see, uh, lawmakers really neglecting it, though. It, over the last 30 years, not only have we left alcohol taxes at their same rate, we've allowed inflation to eat away at them because yeah. we, we tax alcohol. This is kind of subtle, but we tax alcohol by the volume that is sold, not by its price. Mm -hmm. So that means a $6 pack of Budweiser 20 years ago has the same tax on it as a $12 pack of Budweiser has today. So uh, all told, you know, we're kind of turning our back on one of the most important measures to addressing excessive alcohol use. Um, and that's not only true in New Mexico, that's true across the country. Mm -hmm. Representative, Absolutely. please, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, it, that's all true. And uh, especially to prevent underage drinking, um, because if the younger you are when you start to drink, the more likely you are to become uh, an a lifelong abuser of alcohol and see those effects. In 2017, um, we had a group that was trying to um, address that and raise the tax. I think it was a quarter a drink. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to kind of change that a little bit and come back to trying to make it a percentage so that we don't have to um, have inflation or different things change the effectiveness of raising uh, the tax mm -hmm. and the deterrent effect that it has. Dr. Way, I've got a question for you. Part three of the series is entitled Poisonous Myths, Stereotypes About Alcohol and Native People. 
Uh, this, I think it was probably one of the more fascinating parts of the whole seven-part series, in that these perceptions about Native people are actually quite wrong. Uh, that we, that we, even amongst Native folks themselves, you work in Gallup, I'm, I'm curious what that's, what, you know, your sense of that and how we get past a lot of that uh, perception problem. We certainly see that alcohol affects our population to a high degree. You know, mm -hmm. we certainly see that the percentage of uh, those that suffer that have alcohol-related deaths are higher in our populations here. Mm -hmm. I think there are perhaps some of the misperception are some of the causes for that. You know, it's, as I mentioned before, they really are multifactorial. Um, there's a lot of things that are, you know, if you look at um, the social vulnerability index, which is the something that the CDC puts out that has 15 factors that determine the social vulnerability of a certain community. Um, McKinley County, not surprisingly, has the highest rates of social vulnerability. You know, essentially right. any uh, thing that puts them at risk for not being able to handle certain things, say like COVID, for example which is why we really suffered uh, some challenges with COVID in our, in our area here of the state. So for example, people who live multi-generationally, people who live uh, in higher levels of poverty, um, and lower levels of education, all of these things contribute um, in addition to some of the historical trauma that is not even incorporated into these 15 social uh, vulnerability risk factors, um, historical trauma of our, our Native American communities mm -hmm. and those suffering from depression, anxiety, PTSD. So I think it's so important uh, that we continue to address all of these factors and not just focus on one or two that we may think um, are the main reasons why people struggle with alcohol use disorders. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Mr. Alcorn did a great job in highlighting this and saying that even if you took away all Native Americans um, as part of the statistics, the state would still have the highest rates of alcohol-related deaths, yep. um, even among other populations, other other groups. So I think it's important that it's not a Native American, not a Native American population uh, problem. It's a problem across the state. Yeah, Dr. Venner, please do pick in. up on that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, just two more things. I love that, um, you know, how complex it is. There's um, the other large misconception is that Native Americans have some sort of biological predisposition to an alcohol use disorder, substance use disorder, um, and there's no scientific evidence of that. The, our metabolism rates are the same, our genetics are the same, we have the same vulnerabilities. We do end up with higher rates of alcohol use disorder and substance use disorder more broadly. Um, but it's due to these other factors, which we might call social determinants of health, like high poverty, um, low formal education, unsafe neighborhoods, you know, and not access, food deserts, things mm -hmm. like that, um, systemic racism, discrimination, all of those kinds of things. So there's a balance of higher rates of substance use disorders and higher rates of abstinence from alcohol. So we have some of the highest rates of not drinking any alcohol. Um, compared to all other races, especially in the past month. That would be news to most people, I think. That's, that's interesting to have that out there. Dr. Wei, I'm, I'm curious, there's a, I'm forgetting the name of the drug that uh, combats cravings. I'm curious why, or, or maybe a better way to say it or ask this, is there some momentum to have this drug use a little more widespread, available via your doctor? Because in the case of Steve here in part five, it was almost miraculous what he's had. What should we know? What's the name, name of that drug, first of all? What should we know about it? Thank you for asking. Um, mm -hmm. The medication is called naltrexone, mm. and it's a medication that's available. It helps to block the opioid receptor, which is one of the things that can get triggered with people who um, particularly have positive responses to alcohol. Um, when they drink alcohol, they might get the positive response that that made them feel good. And in fact, some people say that when they're drinking while they're taking the medication, it actually helps to stop that positive cycle of, huh, when I drink, I don't really get these, I don't really get those positive responses. I don't feel bad, mm -hmm. but I don't get such um, euphoric effects to want to drink more and more. And so it kind of stops that cycle of addiction. It's because I think people put alcohol use disorders into a separate category of disease, unlike ALS, where there's like, he's like, he said that, the you know, like a lot of advertising on how to, you know, in increase treatment. There's a little bit of, th there are a lot of other, um, factors and um, stigma that play around with alcohol use disorders such that people don't necessarily want to advertise it and try to improve and try to improve treatment. And so I think that's one of the reasons why doctors also may not 
necessarily think about prescribing a medication. Um, there's a whole sense that it's a moral failing rather than actually a medical uh, disease that should be treated just like any other medical disease. Mm. Even if people relapse, we do lots of things that we try to, you know, treat to prevent relapse as well. So just and putting that in the realm is super important. Interesting. And I was just going to interject, you know, I think what Dr. Wei has just put her finger on is one of the most important challenges for our state and any state to address this problem, which is stigma, um, mm. shame, uh, because it affects not only, of course, how people access treatment, how doctors think about it, but it affects how lawmakers think about this. When we're talking about um, the disparities that we see in our state and the preconceptions people have, uh, for example, about a predisposition towards alcoholism among Native people, you know, that's not only untrue, but it, it allows us in a kind of pejorative way to put the responsibility on someone else. And if you really step back and think that an alcohol disorder is an illness like asthma, like high blood pressure, like diabetes, um, and you sort of set that realm of objectivity around it, then you realize, oh, of course, we as a society would want to do everything we can to make access to the appropriate treatments easier for everyone, but also to make a safer environment where we have less of that disease emerging in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look around and you see New Mexico has much higher rates of alcohol disorder and, and, and the consequences of it than other places, it forces us to recognize that we, we don't have a safe environment when it comes to alcohol right now. Um, it's much more unsafe than any other state. And so we really have a collective responsibility to take the steps to, to make it better for everybody. Welcome back to our line opinion panelists. We have one final discussion topic this week, a historic budget surplus for New Mexico. According to reporting in the Albuquerque Journal, lawmakers will have a projected 2.5 billion in quote new money during the budget year that starts in July 2023. Now that's on top of a 3.8 billion for this year. When it comes to spending this money, however, everyone has their dream projects for their constituents, as these things should go. But that doesn't mean that's the way to go. Senator Snyder, without another legislative session until next year, how should lawmakers go about finding the best way to use this money? That is theoretically what interim committees are for, ah. is you have people come and make presentations, mm -hmm. you talk about the issues, and then say, this group says, you know, the transportation people say, we need roads more than anything else. This right. is why. Yeah. Others say education, we need buildings. This is why. And then it, because it's going before the finance committee. Uh, and so then they should take all that information and make a decision. I've always been an advocate of, of taking monies off the top of, of capital outlay monies and stuff and mm -hmm. doing a complete project yep. yeah, because you can't keep giving someone $50,000 a year and the building cost 14. So I, I think that it gives them a real opportunity if they take advantage of it mm -hmm. to have people come and say, and if you don't come and make a presentation or you don't get us information to legislative finance, then we can't, you won't be in the line, so to speak. But I think it's, I think serious consideration should be given to all the things we've talked about mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. What, one of the things we talked about was more materials and equipment and stuff for law enforcement. That's right. Across the state. That's right. Uh, so it's not like this is a surprise about where we should spend the money. We already have some identified needs. That's right. Then once you take care of those, then you have the rest that you can just say, okay, this is a second tier need. Mm -hmm. let, me, you, let, me ask, let me ask TJ this, um, um, Senator. Uh, there's a great quote from uh, Senator George Munoz. He says, quote, you can change the complete path of this state, meaning, you know, the kind of money that's uh, uh, coming in, TJ. He's yeah. not wrong there. How do we, you know, managing largesse, however, is no small thing. <laughs> it's easy to screw <laughs> up. Well, I, I thought it was interesting that uh, the governor appointed Marty Chavez as the uh, as the uh, as as the uh, czar of all the money that is coming into the state. And I think that that is right on point as to, you know, first, what a problem to have that we have all this money. How many right. how many states can say that we have this? But then but the other problem is, since not many states have this issue, 
people are confused on you're you're right people are confused on how to spend it what do we do we got all this money oh my god and 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 the, and the, and the, the scary part is making big mistakes mm-hmm. you know uh, how can we you know new mexico is at the bottom of so many lists so maybe we should focus on uh, where New Mexico's hair is on fire right now mm-hmm. and go to the mm-hmm. bottom of these lists and education and health care and all these places. How could we make bridge. things? <laughs> Bridges and, and bridge. roads are, are huge. I, I appreciate you getting that, slipping that in there. Hey, so the, sup- the surplus is fueled largely by, no surprise, booming oil and gas revenues. So how important is it to make sure any projects born out of the surplus are paid up before an inevitable bust in the economics, national economics. Can we, getting sort of where- That's a great centered, question. You know, one of the at. things that's sort of tough is that over time, we have been very conscious of the fact that there is a boom and bust cycle. Right. And so there is fear, for instance, of allocating recurring funds um, because who knows how long they will be available. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would agree with this group though, that we, we know many of the priorities that need to be addressed. Um, I'm going to throw an extra one in here. And if you watched our Thursday Facebook Live as we warped up for this show, plug mm-hmm. for that. I think you can go back and see it still. Mm-hmm. You know, we had a bit of a conversation about renewable energy. And one of the things I anticipate seeing from at least some of the folks at the next legislative session is let's not put any money in that would, you know, cause us to lose oil and gas revenue. Well, we have a real need in this state to invest as well in renewables and um, and environmental concerns. And so, you know, I I would say, yeah, yeah, we want the we want the money to keep coming, but we need to be aware that we need to balance that against the health of our communities, the health of our state, health of our country and the health of our world. That's right. You know, Senator, there's an interesting uh, little bit here you know, we have all this money come in. However, we have the highest unemployment rate in the country right now inside this historic surplus. Is that a symptom of the low paying jobs available or something larger? What's what's going on there? How come those two things can, can happen at once? I because I think also if you look at how many people are employed mm-hmm. in the oil and gas and extractive industries, business, that also is going to be a boom bust number but i think that yes i think it is that situation that we are the low, one of the lowest paid but everybody you have to remember everybody is not benefiting from all these revenues mm-hmm. your small businesses um you know unless the people have the money then they can't go and spend it at the small businesses that we have so our small businesses are not benefiting from all this money, the state is, Mm -hmm. and projects are, but we're talking about the lifeblood of our state or all of our small businesses and hiring that extra person. I've forgotten what the number is, but if every small business just hired one person, we wouldn't have an unemployment problem in New Mexico. So we have to think in terms of how that is going to impact our small business community. Good points there. Thanks again to our line panel, as always, for this week. Be sure to let us know what you think about any of the topics the line covered on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages. And to you, thank you for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico and Focus provided by viewers like you.